Well, welcome to the 700 Club. Energy costs rose 11 percent in just in the month of March. Groceries jumped 1.5 percent. Soaring inflation is hitting Americans hard. Well, two leading indicators show that inflation is at its highest in 40 years. This comes as the war in Ukraine is threatening the global food supply. Dale Hurd reports. Most of us don't remember inflation this bad, and for good reason. It hasn't been this severe since the 1980s. Everything's going up at least a dollar, which, you know, adds up, of course, especially when you know, have kids and, and got to get groceries. On Tuesday, the Labor Department announced consumer prices jumped 8.5% in March, the fastest clip since 1981. Then Wednesday, it was reported that wholesale prices, the producer price index, climbed 11.2% from a year ago. The big driver was the, the gasoline prices, which were up 18% month over month. Economist Stephen Skanky has worked for multiple administrations. He says energy and Russia's war on Ukraine have literally fueled our inflation. The United States in 2019 was a net, net exporter of oil. Uh, and, and we discovered after the invasion that we were actually importing Russian oil. And that, that creates a, a problem. Energy prices are up 36% compared to a year ago. That plus pandemic-induced supply shortages have whiplashed the U.S. economy and left many families in a lurch. I come to the food bank every week because they have fresh vegetables and stuff that I can't necessarily afford. Skanky sees some bright spots. Core prices show supply chain issues are beginning to improve and business investment is growing. Worldwide, however, there's little encouragement. Like Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen says 275 million people face acute food insecurity. I am deeply concerned about the impact of Russia's war on food prices and supply, particularly on poor populations who spend a larger share of their income on food. In Washington next week, the World Bank and IMF will look at these food shortages and inflation and how they could worsen global political unrest. Dale Hurd, CBN News. Well, get ready for more high prices. I don't see this uh, slacking off anytime soon. The, the taking Russian oil off the market is absolutely going to increase the price of oil, uh, price of natural gas. Uh, so as energy costs increase, that gets passed along the line because everything is dependent on transportation to get delivered to your store. So if transportation costs are going up because fuel costs are going up, then prices are going to go up. Add to that, Ukraine is the largest producer, one of the largest producers of red wheat in the world. And so you're going to have a wheat shortage, and that's going to increase the price of wheat. And that affects a lot of food prices. So this isn't going away anytime soon. Add to it what our federal government is doing, which is printing a whole bunch of money and trying to add even more stimulus to the American economy because of the, the pandemic. Larry Summers warned them last summer. Here's a Democrat warning Democrats, don't do this. You're going to add to inflation. Uh, they said, no, 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 that's not, you, you don't understand economics, and uh, we know what we're doing. And they passed the stimulus package, and here we are with a lot of inflation, just as he predicted. So are we going to see the politics take over? And the Republicans are absolutely going to blame the Democrats for it, and they're going to blame energy policy for it. The Democrats are going to blame big oil, and they're going to blame Russia. Um, they're going to tr try to, you know, pass the buck, who, who's really responsible. But at the end of the day, uh, it's you and I that have to pay the higher prices. Now, I know enough about economics to know high prices, the cure for high prices is high prices. If you try to get the government involved, they're just going to mess that up. Demand is already softening, uh, so we'll see it. It's going to take some time for this to flow through, but again, the Cure for high prices is high prices. If they're there long enough, demand always slacks off. The cure for low prices is low prices because low prices increase demand. So uh, it, it, this isn't a hopeful message. Uh, we're going to have inflation for some time, 
Uh, and my biggest concern is it will turn into recession. So you have inflation plus a recession in the economy. And that's something we, I lived through in the 1970s. And, and are we going to see that again? Um, but if you're looking for a political solution, if you hear a politician trying to make political points out of this, uh, please shut them off because the, the politics is really not the, the issue. Does it contribute a little bit to the energy policy? Yes, but um, there, there are actually other bigger factors at stake. In other news, a global ministry with a huge following is now suffering serious setbacks. Efren Graham has more on that story from our CBN newsroom. Efren? Gordon, plagued by leadership scandals and the loss of American churches, Hillsong has taken a string of hits this year. Many are wondering what's next and how the Lord will work in the crisis. Senior National Affairs correspondent Heather Sells has our report. In recent weeks, Hillsong has lost its founder and global leader. Many of its American church campuses and its reputation as a global ministry leader that many churches have sought to emulate. We see churches all over the world you know, mimicking Hillsong style and saying, we want some of what they have. We want Author Caitlin Beatty has long followed Hillsong's rise and style, starting almost 40 years ago as a tiny Australian church it is spread to five continents with churches in 30 countries, plus a powerhouse music ministry. What a beautiful name it is. They understand that a lot of a lot of us, especially young people, respond to great music, to beautiful light design, to a sense that you can go into a church and it feels more like a nightclub. Dr. Corne Becker, Dean of the Regent School of Divinity, says the combination of cultural savvy, extraordinary worship, and gospel presentation all played a key role. The clarity of the gospel that they have proclaimed, very easy for people to understand, easy to follow. Recently, however, Hillsong has struggled. In 2020, it fired New York City pastor Carl Lentz, who later confessed to marital infidelity. The church promised an investigation for a, quote, fresh start. Then this year. I've agreed to step aside from all ministry responsibilities. Founder Brian Houston stepped down. First came charges that he concealed evidence regarding his father's child sex offenses. And more recently, he admitted inappropriate behavior with women and problems with alcohol. In March, Hillsong's Phoenix pastor left. I never thought I would be standing here today. Taking with him churches in Las Vegas and Tucson. Other branches in Kansas City and Atlanta have separated from the overall organization. People don't come to church for scandal. They come to church um, to have a safe place. The question now, what can be learned from Hillsong's rise and fall? I think it's a lesson for any Christian ministry to be wary of building uh, ministries or churches' success around the charisma of one particular person. I'm deeply concerned that, because this is played out on television in the public sphere, that the message of redemption is lost. Becker says there's no question abuse victims must be prioritized and that pastors who fail must step down. He also wants a watching world to see grace for those who've done wrong and hear an apology. For those that are watching the public failures of Christian leaders, I want to say to them that we are sorry. I want to say to them, when we fail in ways like this, we want to let you know that this is not Christ, that he is better, that he is greater. A timely message as Easter approaches. Heather Sells, CBN News. Turning overseas now to Russia's war on Ukraine. Ukrainian forces say they seriously damaged the flagship of Russia's Black Sea Fleet with cruise missiles, dealing a potentially major setback to Moscow's forces, still trying to regroup for a renewed offensive in eastern Ukraine. Russia said the crew of the Moskva, seen here in file, was forced to evacuate after a fire overnight, but Russia did not acknowledge an attack. 
This comes after President Joe Biden approved $800 million in new military assistance to Kyiv. He said weapons from the West have sustained Ukraine's fight so far and, quote, we cannot rest now. The U.S. president also, for the first time, called Russia's atrocities genocide. I called it genocide because it's become clearer and clearer that Putin is just trying to wipe out the idea of even being able to be a Ukrainian. More than 4.5 million Ukrainians have fled the assault on their country. Neighboring Poland has taken in more than half of those refugees, where towns along the border are opening their arms to help. CBN's Wendy Griffith reports now from Poland. While one neighboring country tries to take these Ukrainians' homeland by force, Poland is opening its arms to those escaping the terror. Here in the border town of Chemish, many refugees are finding comfort and shelter in the local church. Since the war began some six weeks ago, Pastor Czesław of the Nazareth Church has seen hundreds of refugees pass through his doors. We weren't prepared. Uh, it's just the needs appeared. So I believe that God prepared us in a way and we see the big need, so we respond to the needs. Several areas, including the main sanctuary, now serve as bedrooms for displaced families, while this spacious kitchen, equipped with a cappuccino maker, provides refugees like Anya and her 12-year-old daughter a small reminder of home. We have cold water, we have separate rooms, we have bedrooms. Uh, people are very nice. Anya and her daughter left eastern Ukraine three weeks ago at the urging of her husband, who stayed behind to fight. They're living here until they get their visas to England. We're in constant uh, contact with our friends from Kharkiv, and uh, they couldn't get out of the out of the car Kharkiv because it was constant bombing, and they were like uh, shooting. Even cars were who were trying to leave. Here at the Operation Blessing Tent, many more come through to receive hot drinks, blankets, and enjoy a place for their children to play. If they have nowhere to go, that's where OB and Pastor Cheswaf work together. Several occasions we made a phone call to this pastor and he showed up not even like 40 minutes later with his van and with his team to bring people to the church where they could spend the night. And it's very, very helpful and accommodating and, and that the church is turned into a refugee center as, you, as you've seen. OB also provides them with hygiene kits and other relief items. Anya, a Polish native working with Operation Blessing, says helping these people is what Jesus would do. Can you imagine if Jesus crossing the border, what would you do, yeah? Would you do everything what you can to invite him, to feed him, to keep him warm, to give him clothes if he needs, and help him, yeah, and love him, yes, because he loves us so much that we should share this love with other people. Wendy Griffith, CBN News, on the Polish-Ukrainian border. We must share that love. Gordon? Yeah, the words of Jesus, whatever you do to the least of these, my brethren, you do also unto me. If you want to be a part of helping the refugees, just give us a call. 1-800-700-7000. There's an Operation Blessing Disaster Relief Fund you can give to. We're supporting Orphans Promise Centers throughout Ukraine and in the countries surrounding. You're part of that wonderful relief effort in Poland. It's real easy. All you have to do is call or you can write to us at CBN Center, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23463. Uh, and just put Disaster Relief Fund in the memo line of a check, or you can text OB Crisis to 71777. Either way, do it now. Be a part of helping those in need. 1-800-700-7000. This Sunday, Christians worldwide will celebrate the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Ever since his tomb was found empty, skeptics have refused to believe Jesus rose from the dead. Experts are now taking on non-believers and proving the validity of the resurrection. Paul Strand has the story. Christianity's power all hinges on the fact of the resurrection. But detractors for centuries have come up with scenarios to explain away the reality of the resurrection. One is the wrong tomb theory. Everyone just went to the wrong tomb, an empty one, and assumed Christ had resurrected. 
Indiana Dr. Joseph Bergeron studied the crucifixion of Christ and its aftermath for 10 years. Going to a wrong tomb and finding it empty or uh, doesn't present to anybody's mind that the person resurrected from the dead. Alex McFarland is another top defender of the faith at events like Bible camps and apologetics conferences. He points out another well-known fact. Pilate had dispatched a, a cadre of Roman soldiers to guard the tomb. So everybody knew where it was. There's also the swoon theory that wants you to believe instead of dying on the cross, Jesus only passed out, woke up in the tomb a couple of days later, rolled away the huge stone and escaped. McFarland says impossible. Christ has been at least two to three days without food or water, dehydrated. He was beaten severely, a uh, huge loss of blood, uh, nailed to the cross. And if the always fatal crucifixion process hadn't already killed him, Roman soldiers made sure. They plunged a spear into his chest because to allow any possibility that he would survive the crucifixion uh, would mean that they would die themselves. McFarlane explains the swoon theorists then present this unlikely scenario. He revived himself. He moves a two and a half to three ton stone. He overcomes a dozen Roman soldiers in peak physical condition. McFarlane also sees a moral problem with what the swoon theorist wants you to believe. He told his disciples he had risen and he allowed them to go forth and preach what was false and die for what really wasn't true. This compromises the moral righteous nature of the person Jesus. The stolen body theory proposes that the very disciples who fled in terror after the crucifixion then risked death to steal Christ's body from the tomb and then made up the whole resurrection story. They sufficiently regather and summon up enough bravery to overcome Roman soldiers. I mean, this could have been at best arrest, if not execution and death. They move the stone, they take away the body of Jesus, they say he's risen. But that would have been the opposite of Jesus' life and teaching. Everything he's all about is predicated on righteousness, virtue, truth, holiness. Here is truth personified and they build a gospel on a lie, just doesn't make sense. And all but one of those disciples was put to death for this gospel. People sometimes will die for some misguided belief that they have. Nobody dies for a hoax. One popular idea is that everyone who saw Jesus alive after his death was just hallucinating. Bergeron points out, though, in the rare documented cases of group hallucinations, they all see different things. None of them experience the same exact thing. Because it's all in their mind. McFarland points out the risen Christ appeared several times and interacted with hundreds of people, as recorded in 1 Corinthians 15. Paul says he was seen by up to 500 brethren at once. Hallucination hypotheses can never explain the group appearances, the group experiences the disciples had with Jesus. Hallucinations are not contagious. Hallucinations generally don't appear in different places uh, to different groups of people. You generally can't talk and converse with an hallucination, and you certainly can't eat with an hallucination. So why not just believe in what the Son of God promised he'd do, resurrection? His identity message credentials were validated by the fact that he did what none of us could do under our own power, he rose from the dead. I'm more convinced that what we believe as Christians is true and accurate than I ever have been. Like so many others across the millennia, Bergeron contends the best explanation for why Jesus wasn't in that tomb Easter morning is what Christ's disciples have always said. He came alive and rose from it. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Indiana. The best proof of the resurrection is always your own experience with a risen Savior. He promises that he will manifest himself. In the book of Revelation, there's this wonderful verse, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hear my voice, that means he's speaking. If anyone hear my voice and open the door, I'll come in and I will sup with him. That is a promise. Uh, hallucinations don't sup with you. Yeah, that's a whole reason we take communion, to have an experience with a risen Savior, to say, I identify with your cr crucifixion. I identify with your resurrection. You don't have to take somebody else's word for it. You can have the experience on your own. If you want this, it's real simple. Jesus 
if you're real, if you really are the Messiah, if you really are my Savior, could you show me? Could you show up for me? When you seek him with all of your heart, you will find him. Seek and you will find. Knock, it will be opened to you. Ask and you'll have it. All you have to do is do that and do it with all of your heart. And you'll get unbreakable evidence that uh, he is what he says he is. He is the living God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He will prove himself strong to you. All you have to do is ask. If you need help with this prayer, all you have to do is call us, 1-800-700-7000. Terry? Well, fans of TV's Gold Rush know that mining is no easy job. The machinery breaks down, the claim may have run dry, and the Department of Fish and Game is watching like a hawk to make sure that everyone has the right permits. Well, the Hoffman family endured all that for eight years. Now, they're back with a new series on the Discovery Channel. Take a look. In 2010, the Discovery Channel launched what will become their number one program, Gold Rush. The show centered on the Hoffman family mining for gold and ended in 2018. The Hoffmans are back with a new show. It might be the richest mine that we'll ever get a chance to mine on. But this time from a different perspective. Hoffman Family Gold gives viewers a close look into the relationships between Todd, his father Jack, and son Hunter. And there's another difference. Hoffman Family Gold will emphasize the family's faith in Jesus Christ which they believe matters more than gold. Well, Todd Hoffman joins us now via Skype. And Todd, we welcome you back to the 700 Club. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, you know, isn't that strange? There's actually a Christian family that's that's going on reality TV. That's It's been a little bit rare, isn't it? <laughs> it is a little bit rare. <laughs> well, your adventures have taken you from the Yukon to the jungle. So tell us why your family decided to step away from Gold Rush. You know, you, I felt like I kind of, you know, in reality TV, it gets, it gets a little rough. You know, they, they kind of want to lean towards a little bit like throwing a wrench at, e at, at each other. So you get to this point where you feel like, you know, the vision that you like, cause, cause I created the actual show. So the vision kind of was getting strained and, and then I was getting a strained relationship, you know, with my son. And, um, you know, it's hard to raise your family basically on a mining TV set, you know, and every, everything is just your, your, your dirty laundry. Everything is just out in the open. So I think, I think I just prayed about it and we just said, you know, it's time for us to step back and, and start to work on our family and just go home and have a normal life for a while. And, we did that for several years, and then we kind of, you know, then COVID hit, right? And uh, I, I watched my father um, start to build a wash plant, like, you know, some mining equipment out in the parking lot of our house. And it's like, I'm like, uh-oh, ja you know, Jack's not done mining. He still dreams about it, and he's still you know, he still has this vision to go back. And so um, I'm like, uh oh, I better start, you know, working on seeing if we can do this again. And uh, had an opportunity that popped up, as you're going to see, uh, you know, we're out Friday nights at 8 p.m. on Discovery. But what you're going to see is um, this little bit of daylight of possibly getting back in the gold mine, mining again. And, uh, you know, and so then I called Discovery and I said, okay, listen, here, you know, you remember me, you know, the, you remember the fat kid that uh, yeah, they're like, yeah, we remember you. So uh, I said, I'm thinking about coming back, but I can't, I can't come back like before. I said, our faith needs to shine through our, you know, what we're really about needs to shine through with a different pace. And I said, I'd be interested if you guys are. And boom, here we are. Yeah. Well, gold mining is risky. 
it's stressful, as you've talked about the stress that it, it put on your family. You've seen the toll it's taken on family firsthand. How has your family's faith helped you through that all? And how are you going to change things with, with your new adventure so that doesn't happen to you again? So I think that I need to re release some of the control over to my son, Hunter, who's, who's now a young man. You know, he's 22, 23. I have another son that's 20. I mean, I'm a grandpa. So like that father-son dynamic um, needs to be, I need to be very careful with it and to allow myself to step back at times, even if, if I know that that decision might be wrong is to let Hunter go in there and make that decision right or wrong. So, you know, gold mining is, is, is a strange animal. A lot of you have watched me over the years. A lot of you beyond, to be honest, have left discovery channel and when I'm, you know, this is an invite for everybody to come back and follow this adventure because this mine is different than anything we've ever mined before. It, it's like there's something special at this place. Even though we're little, we don't have equipment. Even though we're, you know, we love Jesus Christ. And, and it's like, you know, after listening to everything that's going on in the world. I don't know how anybody gets up in the morning and goes through their day without being covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And it's like, how do you do that? So like, for me, I want to just encourage anybody out there. If, if you don't have a faith in Jesus, I mean, this is the time to, to really buckle down and ask Jesus Christ into your heart. And um, that's really, that's, this is, that's like kind of the main focus for me personally. It's not a Christian TV show, but it is Christians trying to dig gold out of the ground all the way up by Russia in the middle of nowhere. Uh, so like, if you want a, some crazy TV to escape the, what's going on in the world, man, this is, this is your chance Friday night discovery channel at 8 PM. Well, Todd, one of the things that you all are known for is being good stewards of God's creation. I know that's important to you. And I think people respect what you do because of that. Talk about that. So when I went down into the jungle, um, what I saw down there was actually devastating. And what is happening in Peru, Guyana, and these different areas is, yes, they are destroying the rainforest down there. And it made us stick to our stomach. We actually had meetings with the government down there to find out how we could help to actually enforce some of the rules that are not enforced around the world. Um, and then we, what we do is we reclimate. Whatever we dig up, we actually put back the, the, the topsoil, and then you put the seeds back over the top. And um, we actually have been nominated for two awards for reclamation. Uh, I know Discovery Channel loves us for that. Um, and so, like, obviously, as Christians, we don't, you know, we don't want to just dig up the earth and keep going. We, we really do care about those things. And so, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's very important. You know, it's really important how we get our gold. Then it's more important how we get our gold than how much gold we get. And that includes how we do it with our faith, our relationships, but also with the earth. You know, we're, we're called to a higher standard as Christians. Uh, and we know that. I know that's all going to be part of your new program. I want our viewers to know that new episodes of Hoffman Family Gold air Friday nights on the Discovery Channel. And Todd, thanks for being with us. We wish you the best with your new program. Hey, thanks for having me. Uh-huh. Welcome back to the 700 Club for this CBN news break. The suspect in the broad Brooklyn subway shooting, Frank James, will be arraigned in federal court today. Police arrested James Wednesday after he reportedly called in a tip on himself. Police are still searching for a motive in the shooting that wounded 10 people. James posted dozens of videos ranting about race, violence, and his struggles with mental illness. He has an erratic work history and a string of arrests for mostly low-level crimes. Turning now to pro-life news, Oklahoma's Republican governor signed a bill into law this week making performing an abortion a felony. 
The bill does allow for an exception in cases that would save the life of a pregnant mother. The law is set to take effect 90 days after Oklahoma's legislature adjourns next month. Abortion right advocates say the bill is guaranteed to face legal challenges. The flurry of state activity comes ahead of an expected ruling from the Supreme Court over a Mississippi abortion law that some analysts believe sets the stage to overturn Roe versus Wade. That's the decision that legalized abortion in America. I want to remind you, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website. It's CBNNews.com. Doctors feared that a two-year-old boy from Honduras might go blind. He needed immediate surgery. The problem, his father could never afford the operation his son so desperately needed. Jesus loves his dad and gets excited whenever he comes home from work. But when Jesus turned two, his parents noticed their son struggled to see. He stumbled when he walked and sometimes fell. He also seemed to be unable to focus his eyes on anything. This is Jesus' dad, Jonathan. I also noticed that if Jesus had something in his hands, like my phone, he had to bring it close to his face to see it. That's when I knew something was wrong. In spite of the risks from the COVID pandemic, they took their son to see an eye specialist. Jonathan told us they diagnosed his son with congenital cataracts in both eyes. He said the doctor urged them to schedule surgery immediately to prevent permanent vision loss. I have cried for my son many nights. I wake up and ask God, why does Jesus have this problem? Jonathan is a taxi driver. His limited income, especially during the pandemic, meant they could not afford to pay for the operation. I would like to have money, not to be rich, but to be able to pay for my son's surgery. He needs it now. There is no time to wait. The next time they went to see the eye doctor, Jonathan confessed that they could not pay for the surgery. So a staff member at the clinic mentioned how Operation Blessing has helped other families with free surgeries. When we met with them, we told them that some Operation Blessing donors had made it possible for Jesus to receive free surgery on his eyes. Thank you. Thank you so very much for this news. Operation Blessing Honduras arranged for Jesus to receive surgery in both eyes at a nearby hospital. The surgeon removed the cataracts and replaced them with new lenses in both eyes. Doctors told the couple that their son's sight had been restored. To the donors that gave to Operation Blessing to help my son get surgery, I want to say thank you. They are far from here and I don't know them but I pray God to bless them. That thank you, that prayer for God to bless you goes to you if you're a member of the 700 Club. We're a lot more than a TV show. We want to reach out with hands of love and compassion to people in need all around the world, whether that's refugees in Ukraine or a little boy in Honduras that needed cataract surgery. You were there. You were part of the, the wonderful thing that can happen when tens of thousands of people say, yes, let's make a difference in the world. Let's do good things for people. Let's be the hands and feet of Jesus extended to the least of these, our brethren. When we do that, wonderful things happen. People give praise to God. People ask for blessings for you. It's wonderful what happens when we all get together and say yes. If that's you, if you want to join, call us, 1-800-700-7000. Just say, I want to be a member of the 700 Club. Now, how much is that? It's just $20 a month, 65 cents a day. Some of you can join at higher levels. If you're already a member, I encourage you to increase. So go to 700 Club Gold, $40 a month. 1,000 Club is $1,000 a year. That breaks out to $84 a month. We also have founder, 5,000 or, or more a year. At whatever level, God is speaking to you to join. Do it right now. 
1-800-700-7000. You can also give online at CBN.com. We have a new thing where you can text to give. You can text the letter CBN to 71777. Now, when you call and join, I want you to have this. It's my father's latest book, The Power of the Holy Spirit in You, Understanding the Miraculous Power of God. In this book, my father uh, talks about 60 years of ministry, how my mother and father would gather in prayer they would agree in prayer, ask God for guidance for CBN, for Operation Blessing, for Regent University. God would answer them. And the keys and the secrets to how to do that are all in this book. So if, if you want it, join the 700 Club, 1-800-700-7000. Angela didn't think she would ever have a baby. Then at 39 years old, she got pregnant. Right before her third trimester, she started having intense pains. And she knew it wasn't only her baby's life that was in jeopardy. They were ready for me to have a stroke or a seizure. And they were like, okay, you're going to go to the OR now. And I said, wait, we have to stop and pray. Dr. Griffith basically explained to us, your organs are shutting down. The only way I can do anything is to save your life is to take this child, even though he's only at 27 weeks. So that's when people started praying, yeah. In 2013, Neil Lorio and his wife Angela were thrilled to be pregnant with their first child, Jean Paul. But on Palm Sunday, Angela became seriously ill. Neil rushed her to the hospital. We were about 20 minute ride normally to the hospital. We got there in about six minutes. They went to take her blood pressure. They couldn't do it with the machine. They had to do it with, uh, by hand. And it was 200 over something and that was very scary. Angela was diagnosed with HELP syndrome, a condition similar to preeclampsia that put her life and the life of Jean-Paul at risk. If preeclampsia goes on to become much more severe, then it can uh, end up in HELP syndrome. And that stands for hemolysis, elevated liver enzymes, and low platelets. It can be a high rate of of dying from this condition for women and obviously for the baby that they're carrying. And so I did have this conversation with both of them to let them know that uh, we will need to go forward to deliver um, John Paul. I just turned it over to God because if something happened to me, what would happen to John Paul? I didn't know how I was gonna take care of this child myself, so I was just praying that she was gonna pull through. John Paul was delivered via cesarean section he weighed just one pound, 12 ounces. Still, the life of mother and child hung in the balance. They didn't know until his routine 10-day cranial ultrasound that the ventricles in his brain were large and building up with spinal fluid. In addition to that, um, he wasn't breathing. He wasn't getting the oxygen that he needed. And I was discharged on Good Friday, which we now know was too soon. I was swelling so much, I had to actually go to a jeweler and have my wedding ring cut off. And it was Easter Sunday, early in the morning. So we went back to the emergency room and they had to take some fluid off and put me on an IV. Angela slowly began recovering. She now turned her attention to helping her son who desperately needed surgery. He could not be extubated. He had to stay on the ventilator. They said, let's try. I said, can we give him one more chance before he goes into surgery to get a trach. And when he was on my chest, he was literally clawing up my chest because he couldn't breathe. And I said, how soon can he have that surgery? Jean-Paul struggled in the NICU unit of the hospital, his mother constantly by his side. I didn't leave. And it was those little miserable half sofas in the NICU that I had that they let me stay, thank God. It was heartbreaking because he was in an isolate and I couldn't touch him. Unless he was having a good day, I couldn't even hold him. Angela and her community of faith prayed for Jean-Paul's survival and a successful surgery. Although it was heartbreaking, after that, he thrived. He gained weight. It was miraculous. Even the look in his eyes, you could see the look in his eyes. He's like, okay, I can breathe. Five months and several surgeries later, Jean-Paul was ready to go home. Then I actually saw him for the first time with nothing on his face. There were no stickers, there were no tubes in his mouth or in his nose. And I saw his face, it was God. 
looking back at me to be able to see that after seeing him suffer for so many months. And also his neurologist, she said, you know what? He's gonna make it. And I knew I could take that to the bank. I absolutely believe prayer was a factor here. I pray before procedures or surgeries on any of my patients. And in this case, we prayed openly together. And I believe that the hand of God was with us while we were going through this and continues to be with Jean-Paul. Although he has some developmental delays, Jean-Paul is growing and thriving today. His parents thank God for the gift of life they see in their son every day. We didn't know if he could walk. We didn't know if he was gonna be able to talk. And now having him run and jump, I just ask God, how? <laughs> I just can't believe it, even though it's been almost nine years. Just as she sees John Paul as a miracle in her life, that happiness and joy comes back to so many others that he encounters. And it's a constant reminder of God's presence in this world. And I'm continuously impressed with Angela and her ability to look at everything through the lens of the goodness that God gives us every day. This is a story that God wanted to happen so he could get the glory out of it and he, he could show what people of faith can do. Our churches, our friends, you know, people all over the country were praying. That's why we made it through and we cannot praise him and thank him enough by our lives. What a wonderful testimony of God's faithfulness of persevering through prayer. And, and this wasn't just a one-off thing. Uh, when you have a, a little baby in the NICU for over five months, that is persevering prayer. For those of, have, of you who have been suffering for some time, uh, reframe how you think about it. Because um, I, I hear this a lot, God hasn't healed me. Or, or I don't have that gift, or I, I don't have these things. Add a yet to the end of that sentence. God hasn't healed me yet. And let that hope give you the faith that you need to believe so that you can appropriate your healing. The first sermon of Jesus, as we find it in the first chapter of the book of Mark, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Right before that, he says, the time is fulfilled, so that means now. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. That means it's right here with you. You can reach up and grab it. Change your thinking and believe the good news. Watch over the words of your mouth so that the words of your mouth reinforce God hasn't healed me yet means that he's going to. When a man born blind was brought to Jesus, his reaction is, this happened that the glory of the Lord would be revealed. For you, say, the glory of the Lord is about to be revealed in me, in my body, in my testimony, in my family. He is going to work all things together for my good. Have that faith appropriate what heaven has for you. In heaven, is there any disease? Is there any sickness? Is there any pain? The answer is no, it doesn't happen there. So we are to pray that God's will would be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let's do that, let's agree together. Before we pray, here's some other miracles that have happened because of prayer on this show. Here's Mary by email. Last fall, I had a thrush, I had thrush for about two months. My mouth and throat hurt so much I couldn't talk. I had to eat soft foods. I was given three different medications in a row, none of which worked. On October 25th, Terry said, someone has thrush-like welts in their mouth. No medication has worked. All pain is going now. Raise your hands now and receive your healing. All the pain left. I was healed and could talk and eat again. Hallelujah. What medicine couldn't do, God did. 
great physician. Well, this is Robert. He sent this in via email. He said, as a CBN partner, I watched the 700 Club daily. After suffering excruciating pain in my right hip for several weeks, I feared I may have to consider future hip surgery. On April 5th, this year, during Terry and Gordon's prayers for healing, Gordon proclaimed healing for someone with right hip pain. I am thankful to report I agreed with them for healing. My hip pain left me. I am able to get up, walk, and move with absolutely no pain. And the pain in my hip has not returned. Hallelujah and praise God. Indeed. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you. We come to you with thanksgiving for who you are. You are healer. You are the God who heals our disease. We thank you for it. We receive you. We receive the answer to every human need. Be with us now, for we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. There's someone you have a searing lung in infection, and I believe the cause that was somehow or other you in in inhaled extremely cold air. God is healing your lungs now. He's restoring the tissue. He's giving you complete health now in Jesus' name. Tara? Yeah, someone else, you have an issue with the rotator cuff. It's on the left side, and uh, it, it's not completely torn, but it is ripped. And God is healing that for you right now. Just begin to slowly do what you couldn't do before as he restores it completely. There's Jesus. someone with, with nerve pain on your right cheek that goes up uh, to your eye. God's healing that for you right now. In Jesus' name. If you've been healed, let us know. Share in your good report. 1 800 700 7000. Here's a word you will show me the path of life in your presence is fullness of joy. <laughs>